Well, hello everybody. Um, my name's Louise Savage. Welcome to my channel if you're joining me for the first time and welcome back if you are a returning viewer. Um, so I um, recently read um, this lovely book, um, Jeanette Winterson's Weight. And this is a book that's sat on my bookshelves for a long time. It was written in 2005 or published in 2005. And for some reason, I don't know why, I hadn't got round to picking it up. And it really, really got me thinking because um, she, it's just a, a gem, an absolute gem of a book. Um, I love the fact that she takes Atlas and Hercules or Heracles in Greek um, as her focus for this story. I think it's a really interesting choice. So Atlas um, is the uh, mythological character who carries the world on his shoulders. You'll have seen images of him uh, underneath his globe, hunched up. Um, and Heracles, of course, is one of the mightiest uh, heroes of um, ancient Greece, famed for his 12 labours. And in this novel, she kind of brings the two characters together and... Um, and describes the moment when Heracles takes over from Atlas, um, gives him a break, carries the world on his back and the consequences of that here. And I just love the dynamic that she creates between the two characters. I thought her interpretation of the gods was really interesting. And um, I loved the fact that this is a book that completely understands something that I think is really important about mythology and about retellings of classical myths, is that they are such fluid, moving, changing things. There is no such thing as the version, um, I don't believe, because every time we, we take on a story and we tell it, and these stories were rooted in um, oral storytelling. So every time we take on a story and retell it, we kind of make it our own. And we emphasise the things that we think um, might give particular messages to society. Um, and it's beautifully written. It's really sort of sparse um, prose in a way. But my goodness, she packs these beautiful, simple punches of metaphors and similes and so on. Um, I just, yeah, I loved it. And, and I also loved the fact that in, the, in this... Um, story she obviously atlas carries the burden of the world on his shoulders but she also kind of makes you really think about how she makes it relate to us as contemporary humans as it were and thinking about you know the burdens that we all carry and, and our attitude towards those burdens so i just can't commend this highly enough actually as a as a lovely exploration of a myth and um as an example of how mythology can still be incredibly relevant and pertinent to our our own lived experience even now in 2022 so there we go Jeanette Winterson's weight and that um got me thinking about you know retellings of myth again and and um you lovely people out there who um quite often ask me for more recommendations in terms of um you know classical retellings so um of course, because I'd been reading about um, Heracles, I was thinking about other, you know, how do I know about him? What, what? Because actually there aren't, um, he really sort of, we know most about him, I suppose, from um, things like Aristophanes' Frogs, which is a comedy and gives quite a sort of, you know, obviously a, an inflated impression of him. Um, and we know about him through some of the um, the tragedies that survive. Um but he's often referred to in passing. We know a lot, a lot about him actually from, from um, ancient pop painting as well. But anyway, I was trying to think about when I first came across him really. And I suddenly remembered as I was browsing through these, my bookshelves, this came to my attention. Now this is The Golden Shadow and it's written by um, a literary duo. So it's Leon Garfield and, and Edward Blishen. And um, not to forget the outstanding illustrations by, I think he's called Chris uh, Charles Keeping, I was going to say Chris Keeping. Now I've had this book for since the early 1990s. I've had this and its prequel, which we'll come to in a minute. But in The Golden Shadow, um, they retell the story of, of Hercules and 
they don't just focus on his 12 labours, which I think are probably the most sort of commonly known um, aspects of the myth cycle around him, but they also sort of tell his tale right from birth all the way through. And again, it's just the most wonderful storytelling. And I think the language, again, sort of it, it echoes oral culture, but because it's written, it's embellished in this beautiful sort of, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like primeval prose. It's so rich um, and, and yet um, the writing style totally suits the subject matter, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. Um, and inside it's illustrated with these most beautiful, uh, I can't find any now, uh, fantastic um, images all the way through. Um, trying to find another stunner. And they're often quite sort of puzzling. You often have to sort of think really carefully how the image relates to what you're reading. So although these books ostensibly were written for children, um, I don't think there's anything remotely childish about them. I think they are um, classics um, of, their, of their sort of genre. And, um, and I would challenge any adult not to thoroughly enjoy a romp through this um, book. So if you want to know more about the myth of Hercules, this is definitely um, somewhere that I would turn. And um, and also, just to show you, um, this is the prequel, as it were, if there is such a thing. It's not really that, but it's the first um, book that um, Blishan and um, Garfield wrote together. And it's called The Gods Beneath the Sea. And it begins with the creation myth um, of ancient Greece. And then it kind of, we get the birth of the gods. And I think there are 20 myths in here that are kind of interwoven. And again, it's just stunning writing. I think it won the um, Carnegie Award. I think it was published in about 19, ooh, I was gonna say 70, but I think that's really wrong. Yeah, no, it is, 1970. It's published in, oh, my memory is serving me well today. Um, yeah, it was published in about 1970. But um, it is, it's just a stunning, um, again, it's a, it's a fantastic way if you're interested in, you know, ancient myth and you don't feel you know an awful lot about um, some of the perhaps slightly more obscure myths, um, then definitely this is a really, really good starting point. There we go. Next up, I also read this quite recently, is this lovely um, slim um, short story, really. Uh, sorry, I'm, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know why I'm tipping myself off the edge of the screen. I do apologise. Um, and this is Galatea by Madeline Miller. Now, um, some of you might know the George Bernard Shaw play Pygmalion, or you might know My Fair Lady, the, um, the uh, I don't know when that was made, was it the 60s maybe? Um, the musical, which, uh, and there's a very famous film of it, um, in which... Oh, what's she called? Is it Liza? I can't remember. Anyway, um, Professor, whatever he's called, gosh, my memory, drags her up from the gutter and, and sort of trains her to um, uh, speak properly like what one should. Um, and it sort of transforms her life, not necessarily for the better always. Anyway, the story originates uh, in ancient Greece uh, with Galatea and Pygmalion. Um, the story is told most famously by Ovid in his Metamorphoses. He was a Roman writer, uh, first century AD, I want to say, maybe slightly earlier. Um, and he, um, yeah, slightly earlier. And he um, uh, tells the story and the emphasis is kind of on Pygmalion and he creates this statue because he can't find a woman who's good enough for him. Uh, so he thinks, okay, I'm going to make one myself. So he makes this this sculpture, which becomes, you know, his it's his ideal of, of female beauty. And then lo and behold, um, he's the goddess brings the statue to life and uh, and the story continues. So uh, Madeline Miller has written a fantastic take on this story and it's a lovely, I think this would be a really lovely stocking filler um, because she's kind of made the myth, she's retold it with a kind of real contemporary feel and she's given Galatea a voice and the voice is quite, um, 
So Galatea in this version is quite submissive initially. You know, she comes across as this really submissive female who's extremely aware uh, that she was once a statue and nobody around her seems to really want to confront that. They, they seem to be brushing that under the carpet. And gradually she starts to assert herself during the course of the story. And of course, that doesn't go down very well with uh, Pygmalion because of course he's used to being able to assert authority over women. So it's a really interesting take on um, the idea that there are still many, many, many men out there who try to mould and shape their women to fit their expectations. And Galatea uh, is representing, I suppose, the voice of those women who, who try to fight back. Um, so I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's very contemporary from that point of view. Wonderful. Um, okay, and then that got me thinking about other female voices um, from ancient myth. And when I did my um, first video on, on Greek myth and fiction, um, I don't know why I didn't uh, include this one, because this is an amazing um, book by um, uh, Christa Wolff called Cassandra. Now, Christa Wolff was a German writer um, writing... Oh, now, when was this published? Very good question. I would say the 80s, but I'm probably way out. Um, no, 84. Oh, she's doing well with a with a chronology today. Blimey, Louise. Um, so, yeah, so so Christa Wolf wrote this um, book called Cassandra and it, it was written in German and then translated and became very well known. Um, and and I think rightly so. Now, the, the point is that I suppose that Christa Wolf grew up in East Germany during the Cold War. Um, so, you know, behind the Iron Curtain and um, and so she understood about, um, you know, not being able to um, to say what you think. Um, the whole idea of being marginalised by society, the whole idea of not having freedom. And so she, she she chooses to retell Cassandra's story. Now, Cassandra is the priestess. She's a Trojan princess. And she is given a curse and her curse is that she will be able to predict the future, but nobody will believe her. And I always think that's such a nightmare idea. You know, it's a really hideous idea. You imagine you knew that if a member of your family was going to do X, Y or Z tomorrow, like, you know, get the bus to work and the bus was going to crash uh, and you told everybody and nobody believed you. And then it happened. Um, it's just it, I think it's a really grotesque and frightening sort of psychological um concept so so that's the the curse that cassandra is in advert in invert inverted commas blessed with um and so she knows she predicts the fall of troy nobody believes her she predicts the death of um agamemnon when he returns from the war nobody believes her and this depiction of her kind of tortured soul and her again her sort of relationships particularly with men the people around her is a tour de force. I can't think of any other way of describing it. It is not an easy read. Um, you wouldn't want to read it when you were tired. It's quite academic, really, I suppose, in, in style and approach. Um, but I certainly think it 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 deserves um it deserves an audience, uh, even you know, in 2022. So there we go, Crystal Wolf's Cassandra. Uh next up, I couldn't talk about you know, women in uh, myth without mentioning this book again, which is Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. Um, and I picked this up when I'd kind of almost had, you know, sometimes you read several books on a similar theme. And you think, I really don't want to read another one. But but the cover was calling me and I don't know, I did. Uh, it's beautiful. Look, look at those vines glistening. Now, Ariadne is the young lady, the young princess who um, helps Theseus of Minotaur fame. Uh, to escape from the labyrinth uh, when he goes to tackle the Minotaur and in return she kind of expects to be uh, married to Theseus so he, he promises to take her away, take her back to Athens, marry her. He doesn't, he abandons her on an, an island instead. Sorry that seems like a huge plot spoiler but actually most of the novel focuses on um, the second part of her story which is where uh, Dionysus 
uh, God of Wine takes a fancy to her. And I've talked about this novel before because I really appreciated the characterisation of Dionysus in this. I loved it. And at the time I was teaching a play called The Bacchae in which Dionysus features. And um, I was really enjoying sort of marrying the, the portrayal in here with the portrayal that Euripides makes of this changeable, fascinating, um, exotic god. So there you go, loved Ariadne. And finally, where would we be without Mary Reno's uh, reinterpretations of ancient myth? So this is a novel called um, The Bull from the Sea by Mary Reno. Now she was writing, now again, I think she was writing in the 50s. Um, and um, she she was a really, really unusual woman. I, 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 I need to know more about her life story. I don't know an awful lot about it. But one of the things I do know is that she was presenting sort of um, lesbian and gay relationships uh, in fiction at a time when very few people were. Um, and she often uses kind of mythological stories to um, kind of not explore those things, but certainly give them voice, shall we say. Um, however, I don't know enough about her to know anything really about her politics and stuff. I really ought to find out. But anyway, I read this a long time ago, The Bull from the Sea, and um, and I've read many of her novels. Some of them focus, she, she wrote a, a fantastic trilogy about um, Alexander the Great fictionalising his life. She wrote lives of actors and playwrights and that kind of thing, but also lots of um, mythological stories as well. And um, I haven't read them all yet because I like to savour these things and spread them out, as, as those of you who, who watch me regularly will know. But anyway, The Bull from the Sea is great. It's, it tells the story of Theseus after the Minotaur event. Um, so he sails back to Athens and uh, he he takes over as king there because his father has committed suicide by hurling himself over a cliff, as you do, um, because um, he thinks that Theseus has not returned because Theseus forgets the code that if, you know, he should say, change his sail from black to white if he's survived the experience. Uh, and he forgets in his excitement, he forgets to change the sail. So daddy thinks he's dead and, and commits suicide, which is a hideous start for any story, I concede. Uh, but anyway, it tells the story of Theseus. And in particular for me, one of the things I found really interesting about it was that she uses um, the story of Phaedra and Hippolytus. Phaedra is a Cretan princess um, who uh, Theseus ends up marrying. And you can see it's kind of like a political marriage. It sort of makes sense. Athens and Crete have the bit of an issue with each other, hence the uh, the reason why seven young Athenian males and seven females each year are sent to um, to Crete to be gobbled by the Minotaur. Um, there's beef between the two countries. And so you can kind of see why uh, he might want to take on a, a Cretan princess as his, as his wife. It's, a, as I say, a diplomatic marriage. Um, but also the Cretans and the Athenians are different, you know, and there's a, that sort of tension between different two very different cultures. Um, and the novel kind of explores that in a way because they don't, there's a real lack of understanding, I think, between the characters in this novel. And Phaedra um, takes a shine to her stepson Hippolytus and it doesn't end well. That's all I'm saying. So again, you know, this is a novel where you can um, read the novel and then you can go away and you can pick up, you know, um, Hippolytus by Euripides, the tragedy. You, you, I think you'd find it really interesting reading that, having read this. Um, and, you know, there are very other, various other wonderful destinations you can head to. So I suppose this is another example of a, a, a novel which might um, sort of uh what's the word flesh out your understanding and interest of of the ancient world anyway i hope you found that interesting um i really enjoyed i love it i love sort of looking through my shelves and thinking oh what would i you know if i hadn't if i didn't know anything about ancient myth where would i start 
And I think these are, I hope these are really good starting points. Um, and I've got some more videos um, up my sleeve on this subject, but I think it's quite nice to sort of intersperse them with other things. So, um, so yes, I hope you're all well out there and um, I'm off to open mic shortly. So I'm feeling a bit croaky, so I hope my vocal cords are going to be all right. Um, but anyway, uh, see you soon, folks. Bye.